grateful to be here. I'm always happy to share with you what the Lord has put in my heart. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> that was wonderful. Thank you so much, Lorraine. Um, I trust you enjoyed and are feeling better. I wish we could go on. Uh, in few years, we, we will set up a lot of time and we will give a, a, a program so that if somebody wants to join in for the present worship, we can do that. And um, then we, those that just want to come for the wait, they can come for the wait. But I would encourage everybody to just join in from the start. That way you will flow big. So today's topic is um, work out your own salvation. It's coming from the book of Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12. That is the particular scripture that we are going to read. So Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12, I'm using the amplified version. At some point, I'll use the King James version. It says, so then, my dear ones, just as you have always obeyed, my instructions with enthusiasm not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence. Continue to work out your salvation, that is, cultivate it, bring it to full effect, actively pursue spiritual maturity with all inspired fear and trembling, using serious caution and critical self-evaluation to avoid anything that might offend God or discredit the name of Christ. And then the King James Version is shorter. It says, that's the same one. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12, it says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So the Apostle Paul is speaking to the church at Philippi. He wrote it to encourage the Philippians to strengthen their roots in Christ. So in the beginning of the chapter, Paul encourages the believers to be more like Christ. And that's from, we see that in, um, from the beginning of chapter 2 from verse 1 to verse 11. He encourages them to do nothing out of selfish ambition. And then uh, he also encourages them to value others more than themselves. And then at the end there, he talks about Jesus who was God in human flesh. So, and then after talking about this, Paul says, therefore, the beginning of uh, verse 12 says, therefore, meaning I have said all these that you need to do as the Philippians. Therefore, you must now do A, B, C. That is where we must work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Unfortunately, this scripture has been used to instill a lot of people. We are almost told to work out, or rather we are told in most cases to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And it's, it's like we are told to, to be so scared of God, but it actually doesn't speak of that. Something that we need to understand is that we don't need to work for salvation, but rather we have to work it out. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, I'm using the Amplified Bible as well. This is just to talk about salvation because the way that scripture is taught to us or what we have learned before is to have this fear of God in a bad sense. But this kind of fear that the Apostle Paul is speaking about is a good kind of fear. It's reverence, to be in reverence all of the Almighty God. So from Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 to 9, um, he says, for it is, by, it is by grace, God's remarkable compassion and favor, drawing you to Christ that you have been saved, actually delivered from judgment and given eternal life through faith. And this salvation is not of yourselves, not through your own effort. So that is why I was saying, um, it's not about us working for salvation, but rather working out the salvation. So it is not through your own effort, but it is the undeserved gracious gift of God, not as a result of your works, nor your attempts to keep the law so that no one will be able to boast or take credit in any way for his salvation. So from this scripture, we understand that salvation is a gift. It doesn't come as a result of what we do. So when we're talking about working out our salvation, there's really nothing that we are going to do to work for it. We have salvation. 
Um, and then when we read about, uh, when we read verse 12, which talks about um, Apostle Paul encouraging, encouraging the Philippians, we must also go ahead and read 13. Actually, we must read to the end of it so that we have an understanding on the context that it was used. Because sometimes when we just pick up a verse, we misunderstand it or we misinterpret it. What we should rather do is read the whole book or at least read the full chapter or read one verse in connection with other verses. That way we are going to understand it better. So verse 13 of Philippians chapter 2 says, this is King James Version. It says, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of pleasure. And the Amplified Version says, For it is not your strength, but it is God who is effectively at work in you, both to will and to work, that is strengthening, energizing, and creating in you the longing and the ability to fulfill your purpose for his good pleasure. So when we accept Christ um, as our Lord and Savior, his spirit dwells in us. When we accept him, there are biblical principles that, you know, we need to work out. We need to work them inside ourselves and also we need to work them outside of ourselves. So from verse 12, he tells these believers to continue obeying the instructions in his presence um, as well as in his absence. Um, so just to be practical here when Paul is encouraging these guys so that we can understand what it means to work out our salvation and what we ought to do in that regard. Have you seen the way people work when, um, when the boss is around? Everyone is so busy. Everybody is somehow hammering the laptop. Whether they are working or not, we don't know, but they are just being seen to be busy. If you look at your helper at home, some helpers are good. They will work when you are home and they will work when you're not home. But some of them, as soon as you leave, they won't work. And then um, I'll give an example of the time that I was growing up. I'm sure you can relate to this. You if you had a parent or parents like mine, my mother made it clear, okay? This is how we are going to live. If I'm not here or not here, this is how life is going to be done. If you go to visit other people's homes, you shall not eat like this. You shall sit like that. You know, when you sit on the chair, she would actually say, I'll say it in Bemba, she would always say, Ikarango muntu, you know? Like, when you sit on the chair, can you sit like a human being? Don't just sit anyhow. So that, that was her own way of bringing us up. And I'm sure you can relate to that. So I knew that when she was around, I was supposed to eat in this manner. And when she wasn't around, I should eat or dress in this manner. It's the same with our children. We are bringing them up and believing that as we train them, they will continue doing the same things that we have taught them to do, even in our absence. So basically, what Paul is saying here is, um, is that the, the Philippians must continue living the same way that they have lived in his presence. So now Paul wrote this letter when he was in jail, actually, and he's believing that what he had taught them, he was going to continue living that same way. And then um, when we look at us as people that uh, love God, there are times when people, you know, only want to behave spiritually, so to say, when there are spiritual people around them. So if they come to Francine, because Francine loves to pray all the time, they are going to be praying all the time. They wake up in the morning just so they can align with me. If they go to people that just want to clap, that will be their lifestyle. If they are around pastors, everything is, oh, hallelujah, pastor, we praise God. Hallelujah, pastor, we praise God. But is that the lifestyle that we have? So my question to us today is, how is your life when your pastor or somebody spiritual is not around you? And how do you behave between Monday and Saturday? Because Sunday, most of the time, people want to come and they want to worship. And um, it's, it's Sunday, so everybody wants to talk about God. But what is your life like between Monday and Saturday? And then do you only become spiritual when you're around spiritual people? So this is something that needs introspection. Um, 
when we are done with this, just think about how you are living your life. Is it a life that is lived because people are watching or is this your life even when nobody is watching? Is it a lifestyle? So secondly, what I have learned from this scripture uh, of verse uh, 12 and 13, because it is centering around working out our salvation, is that there is a human ability and also a godly or divine intervention involved. We will see that in verse 13. Because in verse, in, in verse 13, I'm going to read that again. I'll read it later. What we need to understand anyway is that before we give our lives to the Lord, we have our mind is programmed in a certain way. So we are working around a certain way. But when we come to know the Lord, when we give our lives to the Lord, there are certain principles that we need to live by. There are certain truths that are revealed to us. There are certain truths that we learn that we should live by. So there are instructions in the Bible. For instance, we talk about forgiveness. Before you come to know the Lord, before you get to read the scriptures, forgiveness really means nothing to you. You are up to tit for tat. You hurt me, I hurt you. You slap me, I slap you. But then when we come to the Lord, um, we learn all of a sudden that, you know what? Even if somebody does this, I should walk an extra mile. Even if I'm slapped in the face, I should do this. No matter how big it is, I should forgive 70 times 7. So and then it's almost like, oh my goodness, I didn't know this part. So now there's a part of me that is expected, you know, from God. Now that is where we begin to work out this salvation. Okay. So let's talk about giving as well. Sometimes we just want to give to people that can give us back. Or we want to give because we know there's a price to it. But what about just giving? So we learn that, you know. Freely you receive, freely you give. But we also just learned that it's not good to just tell somebody, eat well, be warm, without taking care of their needs. A lot of us have a lot of uh, things within ourselves that we can actually share with others, but we don't. Have we learned that part? So we become obedient and we begin to do these things and then God helps us in the process. So there's a part that I, as Francine, need to play. And then there's a part that... God will, will play as well. So as I walk in what he has called me to do, you know, as I begin to understand his instructions, my heart begins to change. And then um, with regards to working out our salvation, it's also about uh, certain things that we need to put off in our lives. There are certain things that you didn't know are not right because you didn't have a guideline. But now when you come to the light, when God shines his light in your heart, you begin to understand that you need to put, put off some things in your life or you need to put on some things in your life because these things that we are supposed to, it's a choice. Nobody will force, force you into doing this. And then there are certain things that you need to repent of. It is part of working out your salvation. There are also things that we need to resist. The Bible tells us about resisting the devil and submitting to God. So I submit to God and then I, I resist the devil. So the scripture actually says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. But how will I resist the devil? So there is temptation coming my way. Temptation comes in different forms. But we need to have that will. So that is the part of me now. We need to have that will that I don't want to do this, but then I need to be in submission to God. If I'm not submitted to God, then I'll be tempted and I'll easily fall into that trap. So if I submit myself to God and resist, resist the devil, he will flee from me. So I'm involved by submitting and then um, the devil flees. A lot of times as children of God, we are actually not working at our salvation. And by that, I mean, we are not living in submission to him. We are not walking in obedience. So we will read the word of God and we will choose what we feel we should live by. So already we are failing in that part. Working out our salvation involves having reverence for him. It is the fear of God that is the beginning of wisdom. But this fear, like I said at the beginning, it is not the fear in a bad way, but rather it is walking in obedience and it is also walking, you know, having reverence for him. So one question one might ask or what I was asking myself when I was actually 
um, preparing is how do you get to do this? How do you eventually get to work in obedience? There are no two ways about this. You will never know what God requires you to do if you don't read the Bible. So for starters, we need to read the Bible. And it is something that I've been encouraging everyone. It's no wonder, you know, people don't read their Bibles. That is why we have a lot of people teaching us wrong things. We don't get the chance to verify what the word says and to seek God so we can have that understanding. So he says, seek me and you will find me. We need to seek him by reading the scriptures. Then he reveals himself to us. He becomes real. So for starters, we need to read the Bible. And we need, it's okay to read the Bible. It's okay to pray, but you need both. You can't just say, I'm praying. You will pray from your own human understanding, but you also need to read the word of God so that you can understand and pray according to his word because his word doesn't return to him void. It's going to accomplish everything else as it, he has purposed it to be. So you can say, but I pray, but what are you praying? You're going to be limited. You need to read the word and have that revelation of who he is. And then we also need to go to church because also we are admonished that we shouldn't neglect the issue of meeting together. So like now we are fellowshipping. So this is a good thing because we can learn. Our spirit needs to be fed. So what really saves us is faith. We are saved by faith. It's a free gift. These things that I've just spoken about, reading the Bible and praying and going to church, these will help us to grow spiritually. If you remember at the beginning of, um, of our session, I was talking about being mature spiritually when I spoke, when I read from the Amplified Vision. Let me just go back to, to that scripture quickly. It's Philippians chapter 2. And verse 12, and um, the Amplified Version, it says, I'm going to skip a few lines there. It says, continue to work out your salvation. That is, cultivate it, bring it to full effect, actively pursue spiritual maturity. So how do we get to spiritual maturity? It is just the way I have explained it. Read your Bible, ask God for understanding. Pray, he will show you, he will open up your eyes. And go to church so that you will learn. Sitting at home or thinking you know everything else won't help. We are in a learning process. I need to learn. I, uh, somebody else needs to learn. Even if I teach, I still need to learn. So I need to continuously also go to a place where I am fed. So we, uh, we can talk about a secret place where God teaches me directly. But I also need to engage with other people. Because God reveals the word to us differently. So I can also learn from you. So that is the reason. So all these things which I have said will help you grow spiritually. But remember Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. I will read it again. For it is by grace, God's remarkable compassion and favor, drawing you to Christ that you have been saved, actually delivered from judgment, and given eternal life through faith. And this salvation is not of yourselves, not through your own effort, but it is the undeserved gracious gift of God, not as a result of your works, nor your attempts to keep the law, so that no one will be able to boast or take credit in any way for his salvation. So two things that I highlighted earlier, it's... Um, you being able to, you being willing to do what needs to be done after you have read the word of God. So you begin to walk in obedience. And then also the issue of staying true to yourself, having a lifestyle that pleases God. Because at the end of the day, it is about pleasing God. He created us for a purpose. So the psalmist always say, um, the psalmist that is, um, from Psalms chapter 139, one of my favorite scriptures, it says, that's from verse 23 and 24. He says, test me, O God, and know my heart. You know, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. 
See if there's any wicked way in me. Other versions will say, or oh, any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So really working out our salvation involves all that. It is walking in the will of God. So it is our part and God enables us to do that. Like we have seen it in the second uh, part of uh, Philippians chapter two, um, verse 13, where we, re we, we read about that, that it is actually God who is helping us to do this. And um, this is what it says, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Okay. So this is what I had for us today. I would like to encourage us to walk in obedience. But in order for us to understand how to walk in obedience, we have to read the word. We have to sit at his feet. We have to know who he is. We have to know his requirements. So I would like to pray with anyone who would like to have a deeper walk with God before we finish. I'm not sure how much time we have remaining. Can anybody see? Um, I'm not sure how much time we have. I can't see. It's 10 to 10.40 and 10.40 to... 11.20, about 11, I think. About 11, somewhere there, yeah. So, not to keep you too long, um, if anybody would like to recommit in your heart, you can just pray. You don't have to lift up your hand or anything. Because, you know, God, <laughs> okay, we see you. <laughs> because God, um, he hears the voice of the heart. There's the voice of the heart I like talking about. Because I've discovered that my heart should be pleasing to God, you know. I can be saying something, but is it what my heart is saying? So I truly desire that my heart is put in the right place and everything that I do comes from the heart. Okay. So we will pray with you. And um, if, you, if there's anybody there that didn't ask, you can just pray in your heart with us. You just recommit yourself and, um, you know, God is very faithful. He is not going to, sometimes he's not going to do it dramatic like you are going to see. Now, <laughs> something that comes to mind is the pillar of cloud and the fire at night and the pillar in the afternoon. He did that to the Israelites. But sometimes when he speaks to us, sometimes... Um, uh, okay. Okay. Yeah, so sometimes he speaks to us directly and it is very quiet and it is not dramatic at all. So you might feel he didn't hear me, he hears. But like I explained, there's your part to be played and then he's there, he's always there. In the Amplified Version, the same scripture in uh, of Philippians 2:13, it actually says he is strengthening us, he's giving us um energy he energizes us and then also he creates in us that longing to be with him that longing to do his will that is what he says so let us pray